if you have chronic fatigue syndrome, and the fatigue, if it has any meaning at all, means you don't have enough energy, then how would an energyless heart act? Well, it would be okay structurally. You haven't had a heart attack. <clears throat> it would act, at least in the beginning, at least, by not feeling well. And if it doesn't feel very well, we call it mild diastolic dysfunction, grade one. Prognosis, good. That's important. Prognosis, good. Not going to die. Not going to need a transplant. Prognosis is good. But guess what? You can't pump well. Because if you don't, if you don't, um, if you don't have enough energy and you don't relax, then you don't get that early feeling that produces a big E wave. They call it E for early, big E wave coming down as the left atrial blood rolls past the mitral valve as you're relaxing. It's almost a suctioning. Open up and suck blood down through the valve. Produces a big E wave. <coughs> if you don't relax well, you don't get that big sucking action. You don't feel well. The next thing that happens is the left atrium tries to contract, of course, to give you a little extra filling. It does that even in normal people. And so what happens when you lack early filling, which is an energy issue, you try to overcompensate by having a more vigorous atrial contraction to try to fill what you can't fill by early relaxation. That causes the A wave to be somewhat more prominent. The E wave is less prominent. Therefore, you get an E to A reversal. That's one of the classic features of left ventricular filling problems. What do you think is going to happen <coughs> as this ensues? What do you think is going to happen when the left atrium tries to contract harder over and over and over, decade after decade after decade? What is the left, left atrial wall going to begin to do? It's going to begin to, to wear out, which causes what? It causes it to change its structure. Uh, they have a, a name for this. Um, it's called remodeling. In cardiology, it's called remodeling. One of the earliest indicators of a problem, cardiomyopathic problem, is you remodel and usually you dilate. Under, under absolute remodeling, which is what I had, everything dilates. <coughs> In CFIS, because you have more of this confined diastolic dysfunction, you kind of have this uh, remodeling primarily in the left atrium. And so it dilates. And so, as they say, uh, if left ventricular function is normal and left atrial, the left atrial diameter is slightly enlarged or enlarged, the diameter is enlarged, you have diastolic dysfunction until proven otherwise. Because what's happened is you can't fill energetically, you have to fill by contraction of the left atrium. And if that's what you're using, then that's what gives, up, gives out first. <coughs> Guess what CFIS patients have? If you look at them, if you look at a Gaussian distribution of left atrial diameter, they aren't on the small side. They're on the large side, and then frankly large. And we see this a lot. <coughs> Another parameter that's, uh, that's useful in diastolic measurements is called the isovolumetric relaxation time, called IVRT for short. It's measured in milliseconds is the time interval from aortic closure to mitral opening. Aortic closure after systole to mitral opening, which precedes early filling by suction, dilatation, and energetic process. I mean, it's, it's suction relaxation, a, a, an energetic process, a normal energetic process. <coughs> and. Um, At any rate, the, um, this left, this, uh, this, this dysfunctional heart is honestly at, at, the, um, at the center of gravity, uh, I believe, of this syndrome. And it, it's because primarily there's an energy problem affecting the mitochondria, which affects early diastolic uh, relaxation first, and then you try to compensate. And everything else is a compensatory effort. And I'll get into that in some detail uh, in this discussion, but I, I thought I would, I'm probably given the lecture right here, and this was supposed to be a preamble, <laughs> um, but I know that a lot of you have heard about this heart thing, and I promised myself that I would, I would stand up here, and the first thing I would say to you is that you do not have 
the normal type of, of uh, cardiomyopathy. You just don't. You do not have systolic dysfunction. You do not have left ventricular impairment. And on that basis, and that basis is alone, if you go into a cardiologist's office with this story, and he sees that left ventricle looking good, he's going to turn to you and say, listen, I don't know what this guy, Dr. Chang, is saying, but you don't have anything wrong with your heart, and you could be no more wrong. <coughs> then if he's saying, well, it's a diastolic dysfunction, what he'll say is, well, I, I don't know much about that. You don't know why they don't know much about that? Because it's actually relatively new, and the truly advanced machines that can actually measure this are only four years old. There's even a field called diastology in, in cardiology. It's brand new, and they're just a few proponents of diastolic function where they think there could be something going on here. But they're not in the majority. They are in the minority. A lot of doctors think, oh, well, well, I don't know much about that. These people don't seem to be dying. The left ventricle function is okay, so I don't really care about it. More important than that is people have, who, who do care about it, who tried to treat it, find that it's, guess what, untreatable. There's no, there's no treatment for this. So they don't have a lot of taste for this stuff. A dysfunction they rarely ever heard about until after they graduated technology that's advancing rapidly that's beginning to, to reveal its secrets. Patients that don't die, patients have normal function, all they're complaining about is fatigue and other things. No treatment. I mean, this is not something cardiologist gets his teeth into. It doesn't compensate him very much. He likes to pass catheters and do other such things. So d don't look to the cardiologist to help you, I don't think. At least that's been my perception. They seem to divide into the groups they normally divide in. One group says it doesn't exist. Another group says, well, it exists, but it's not important. Another group says, well, it's important, but there's nothing to do about it. <coughs> and on and on and on. You've heard this story before. It's a recapitulation of 20 years ago. But they'll change. They, they will change, because I think the story is becoming increasingly compelling, and I hope to show you uh, some evidence of that. By the way, <coughs> Asheville's in the mountains, and it's about, it's about 70 to 80 degrees there <laughs> right now. <laughs> Here is a, a case definition, of course. Uh, all of you are familiar with this. Um, it has uh, two major criteria, eight minor criteria, and several exclusion criteria. This was initially adopted in uh, about 1987, revised in 1994. And as a clinical case definition, there doesn't require any testing for this. It's basically a symptom complex, and we label it as such. A uh, large percentage of patients, um, may, I think, may have this disease but don't meet this case definition, particularly if they have no pain. This case definition demands pain. One of the interesting things, by the way, uh, I, all of you, I recommend this to you because I find it useful. I'm sure you will, too is get a textbook of physiology, and Guyton is the best one, but there are many of them, and read the chapter on cardiology and read the chapter, subchapter on cardiac output, and you'll find some very interesting passages in these physiological textbooks. Can you spell Guyton? Guyton, G-U-Y-T-O-N. <coughs> and one of the things it says, which I thought was exceedingly interesting, is referring to pain. When someone who has cardiac output problems. They depend greatly on their adrenergic tone, adrenaline, to produce appropriate vasomotor contractility at a certain frequency to compensate them at the microcirculatory level for low cardiac output. In other words, you need your adrenaline and you need your vasomotor tone to compensate for low output. With it, you can sustain significant reductions in cardiac output and never know it. You understand that, that concept? This is why the number for cardiac output may not be relevant to the dysfunction completely. You could have uh, two, two people, one with five liters a minute and another with five liters a minute, could be quite different in terms of the level of dysfunction depending on the vasomotor tone, which is controlled by the subcortex. Well, it turns out that people in chronic pain have a diminishment of vasomotor tone. 
on which is depended on to compensate for output problems. And I've always, always been intrigued by <coughs> the idea that I had certain patients tell me I would, they would take a Vicodin, which is hydrocodone and Tylenol, and they say, you know, I'd cut this little thing in half or in quarters, and I'd take one, and it would get me through the day. And I, I don't understand this. I said, Do you have, are you taking it for pain? Well, you know, I've got a little bit of pain, but that isn't why I'm taking this. I take it because it helps me function. And we've seen people in this disease with pain that have much more significant pain, or on morphine even. Um, and what I was struck by is, you know what they give people in congestive heart failure in the emergency room? With chest pains especially, they give them morphine. 